Welcome to UO Today. I'm Paul Peppis, Interim Director of the Oregon Humanities Center. Our guest today is Gerald O'Grady. O'Grady was actively involved in the early years of electronic art. He founded several departments of media studies, particularly at the University of St. Thomas in Houston and at SUNY Buffalo. O'Grady worked closely with the late UO alumnus James Blue, a pioneer American independent filmmaker renowned for his socially engaged documentaries and teaching. Cinema Pacific and the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art kicked off a six-month tribute to James Blue with a screening of Blue's ce celebrated documentary, The March, which was introduced by O'Grady on November 13, 2013. Gerald, thanks so much for coming on the show. Oh, I'm delighted to talk about my colleague, James Blue. <laughs> Tell us about James Blue and the impact his work has had on uh, the world of filmmaking. Well, it's multiple. Uh, as he, uh, he went to the uh, IDHEC, the Institute of Higher Cinematographic Studies in Paris in uh, like 1956 to 58. And then he made a feature film that's still in distribution in France called The Olive, uh, uh, the Olive Trees of Justice, and which won a prize at Cannes that year. It was filmed with uh, f films by Antonioni and Agnes Vader and so forth. And uh, then he came to work. It, it was the only film shot in Algeria during the war years. The only, uh, the only feature film, and it was in fact bombed and so forth, and has bombing scenes in it in the film itself, <laughs> although it's a feature narrative film. And uh, then he came to work for the United States Information Agency and made films in Central America and, uh, and later in Taiwan and China and, and in Brazil and uh, for them. And, uh, and, and then he made the march, which is, we'll probably talk about a bit at some point. Mm -hmm. And then uh, he, uh, he went to, uh, to Kenya and made a, a, a f five films on kind of the culture of Kenya. was part of a program for the Ford Foundation called Faces of Change, where five films were made in five different countries around the world, including China and, and Taiwan and Bolivia and so forth. And Af uh, he worked in, in Kenya, and there was also uh, a series done in Afghanistan. There was a film on kind of the role of woman in the culture, the role of religion, the role of politics, uh, the role of education, and, and, the, uh, and the role of the economy. And so wh what's his legacy as a filmmaker? How does he, has he impacted the filmmakers that have come after him? Well, I think, I think his films are, uh, there haven't been, hasn't been the kind of impact um, that uh, he, he should have had because he made his films for, uh, uh, first there was the French film, which had kind of wasn't, uh, it never got a major distribution in American theaters, although it was shown, uh, the first feature film ever shown at the, at the New York Film Festival, mm -hmm. Seattle Trees of Justice, and that uh, never got a commercial release here, and uh, it caused kind of a scandal in France because it, it appeared to be on the wrong side of the Algerian war, so it wasn't shown there very, very much, although it's preserved. And then uh, he, uh, he made films for the U.S. Uh, Information Service, and there, up until uh, the, uh, 1970, the films made for them weren't allowed to be distributed in this country. Why? Explain that. Well, it's uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the party that's in power in the executive nominates the head of the USIA, uh, and uh, they thought that uh, it could be used if they, they didn't want to, although the films are kind of, some people see as propaganda films, uh, they're shown all over the world. Uh, they, uh, and it's a huge agency, which I'll come back to, but uh, they uh, felt that it, it could be used to influence the people for, you know, Democrat or a Republican. So they're not allowed, they can only be shown abroad. I That's see. changed now, but uh, it was in the rule then. So his films were five films that he made for the agency, uh, some of which uh, were, you know, won prizes, et cetera. They were translated, they were all shot on 35 millimeter. They were translated into 52 languages. <laughs> and we <laughs> and couldn't see them. And we couldn't see them, <laughs> no, including the march. What was unique about his approach to documentary filmmaking? I think uh, at the end of his life, he kind of evolved what he called a, a concept of the complex documentary, in which uh, he had kind of gone beyond the cinema verite, 
uh, as though you were a fly on the wall. He had kind of gone beyond the participatory cinema, uh, gone beyond the idea of, of, you know, of, of revealing the filmmaker making the film, <laughs> and had gone through all of those. And his idea then was that it should, that, uh, that uh, uh, and he called it the complex documentary because he wanted it to include everyone that was involved in a problem, like a housing problem in, in Houston. He would make sure that they went to the real estate owners, to the agencies in charge, uh, uh, to sales, to the people themselves. And uh, he himself would appear in it as kind of a, as a commentator and uh, to keep things moving. And he also uh, would, uh, for example, shoot the mayor of Houston talking about uh, the problem. Then he would show that to the people who the mayor was talking about. And then uh, that would cause problems and they would, the mayor and that group would meet and he would film that. So he was trying to show that it was, that politics was a process. And that, uh, and then when it was shown in, uh, in Houston, uh, this is a film called The Invisible City, he would go out and show the rushes on television, on public television the next week and ask people to call in if there was a problem in their neighborhood. And then a little bit later, they would show kind of an edited version. And then eventually they would show the whole film. And then at the end of the film, you kind of the camera would just turn and all of the people who were in the film would be in the audience and would then have to respond. So it was, a, it was a entirely new <laughs> kind of material. I also am interested in the... But he made those on kind of Super 8 and on, on three-quarter video. And again, there wasn't a... Uh, they didn't get major distribution. Mm -hmm. So the impact, uh, given the ideas and the quality of you see them, uh, w was kind of small. On the other hand, he benefited by these films because, uh, except for the last two that I mentioned, in Houston, they were all very well preserved. They're all shot for the USAA. They're in, in Washington and on preserved on 35 millimeter. They just made a new copy of the March, as you probably know, mm -hmm. yeah. D I mean, he clearly, he, and then there was the interviews, which uh, appeared in Film Comment and Film Quarterly and, and appeared in all of the early academic studies of cinema verite and, uh, and appeared in, you know, uh, uh, in, uh, well, you know, well-known and contributed to the scholarship. So we did have an impact there, although it was by specialized researchers. Tell me about those interviews, just to give the audience a little more uh, information about Well, that. his idea, when he came uh, in 1964, he went to the Ford Foundation, and he wanted uh, them to sponsor a project the way he would interview people who were using kind of non-actors, which was kind of a new phenomenon then, beginning with kind of Rossellini and others. And uh, that eventually led to broadening itself to looking at an ethnographic documentary to kind of all kinds of documentary, whoever was in making important documentary. And uh, he had an excellent kind of voice and excellent training as an interviewer, which he had got here at Oregon. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they, he uh, interviewed um, Alfred Hitchcock for the American Film Institute. He interviewed George Stevens. Uh, he also interviewed feature makers as well as documentarians eventually. He interviewed George Stevens when he was at Rice University. He, interviewed Frank Capra when he was at Buffalo. And, uh, and in France, he interviewed Brisson and Godard, Jean Rouche, uh, Rossellini, <laughs> Antonioni, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera, Incredible. including all the Canadian filmmakers, which almost everyone left out. They had a very interesting kind of direct cinema group. Yeah. So, so why is The March such an important film? Well, I think it's the only film that I know there weren't, uh, that uh, the, the, uh, there was one film made by Haskell Wexler where he filmed a busload of people going from California to Washington, but that's the only kind of recording. And then the newscasts recorded it, but not for kind of, just for their newsreel. I think there were 75 different uh, units there from all over the world who actually filmed it. But he's the only one who actually made a film and he, he actually wrote a script then, and he he edited the film. He sh he he directed it. He had twelve crews that he was directing. It was shot in both New York and in, in Washington D.C. And then he uh, he uh, he wrote the narration. He narrated himself because he had an exceptional voice, and uh, <laughs> edited it, of course. 
And uh, it's the one record we have, really, of that whole day. And uh, it doesn't include the whole speech by King, but very large segments of it. So it's the best, most faithful recording of that day. And uh, then you'd have to see it to, to see its kind of its movement and the way he, uh, and then it was shown all over the world. And uh, was it not shown in the U.S. because of the? Uh, oh yeah, it wasn't shown in the U.S. I mean, it was just not for any reason. The the, the the committees in Congress also didn't want it shown anywhere around the world because they didn't want to uh, help Martin Luther King, huh. and they felt that it was totally. Uh, and uh, he actually wrote an appeal to Congress, and to allow it to be shown, and they eventually agreed, and. Uh, and uh, it was shown uh, kind of worn out. I got a, after he died, I got a computerized list, and I think there was like 70 copies on 35 millimeter. What would happen in those days, it would be entered into festivals abroad, and, uh, but uh, it, it was largely shown in embassies where they invite kind of authors and, and businessmen for an evening of dinner, and then they'd show the film. And this is the way it was distributed. Now, the USIA in those days was, was larger than Hollywood. It made more films than Hollywood mm. every year. And as I say, translated them. His film was translated into, as I mentioned, 52 languages. Okay. So he had an enormous impact in that sense. And the year after the, uh, uh, the distribution of the King film, King won the Nobel Prize. I mean, he became like the Nuke of the North or Charlie Chaplin. He became famous <laughs> all over the world. <laughs> Because, <laughs> because <he had> of <laughs> this film <laughs> being shown, of course, only to the upper classes in, I mean, most places, in fact, uh, in Africa didn't have television mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, yet. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was never kind of, so they weren't kind of popular films, but, but they were films that had an enormous impact in, in that way. I, you know. One of the things I found so interesting about the march is that it, for so much of the film, it focuses on uh, all the people who are going to the march. It's very much sort of from the perspective of the attendees in the march. Oh, the yeah, audience. it's very much a uh, what I call kind of a black musical. In other words, all of the music in it, Odetter, and, uh, and uh, is, you know, it's black music. It's a preacher speaking like a church, mm -hmm. and uh, there's a response. And, and so it's, it's actually a, kind of a, a film that uh, follows kind of black, you know, uh, uh, you know, modes of culture, which is totally unusual for the USIA. Mm -hmm. It's only one person who's seen all of the films uh, that were made for the USIA. And they would make 50, 100 films a year or more for distribution on all kinds of subjects and topics. And uh, a man named Richard Diane McCann, who wrote a book called The People's Films. Hmm. And he said this was the best film ever made by any U.S. agency. <laughs> uh, High praise. Yeah, well, I mean, when you think of the plow that broke the planes uh -huh. <laughs> and yeah. was done and uh, the river and, you know, some of the great classics. So it was, yeah, very high praise. Did Blue ever work in television or video? Uh, he did. Uh, he was very sympathetic to the, uh, to the interests of independent filmmakers. So when he was in Houston, he asked Channel 8 there if they would let him... Uh, have a program called The Territory, where he would bring a young filmmaker or an independent filmmaker, it didn't need to be young, most of them were, uh, and he would interview them and then he would show their film. And later in Buffalo, we, when he came there, he initiated a similar program called The Frontier, which uh, anyone in the kind of program, in the, in the signal area, which included Toronto, or Channel 17 in Buffalo, was, uh, was eligible to send in films. And we'd get two or three hundred films. My organization, Media Study Buffalo, which was an independent organization, sponsored it. And we would choose 13 programs, and there'd be a season every year. So he got involved in that way, and he would do the interview and introduce the maker. And so we had, uh, they went on for, they, the one in Houston still goes on without him. The one in Buffalo went about 10 years and is no longer. So it was the one time that, uh, it independent filmmakers had access to television. Hmm. He never had his own show. I had a show where, in Buffalo where I interviewed 13 makers who were famous like Brackage and Peter Kubelka and so forth, Richard Leacock and so forth, Jonas Mikas, but, and I interviewed him. 
So I had him on interview explaining. He was very committed to kind of getting cameras into the hands of independents, but as young as possible. And he told me a marvelous story once of a young 12-year-old African-American you know, student in Houston, a woman, who uh, he gave a Super 8 camera to, and she went upstairs in her home and interviewed her blind grandmother on, uh, on what it was like in the, in the days of slavery. Mm. And he pointed out, you know, this equipment, the lightweight, the access, and so forth, was, had, you know, essentially revolutionized mm -hmm. film. So he was very involved in film education. Uh, the, you know. I, he, he is, as you say, celebrated not just as a filmmaker, but also as a teacher. That's right. T can you tell us a bit more about him, uh, his teaching, and the kind of teacher that he was? He was very uh, kind of, uh, what's the word? Uh, he was, uh, he had had that kind of training himself at this, uh, I this national school, the Institute of Higher Cinematographic Studies in France in, uh, as, as I think, 1956 to 1958. There weren't national film schools then, but later when they started one in the United States after the, 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 uh, the American Film Institute, mm -hmm. Uh, he uh, he taught there. He was the one selected to start the program. Uh, he later taught at the National Film School in England when that was started. And uh, he uh, he taught at UCLA occasionally. He uh, Some of his students were Paul Schrader, Francis Ford Coppola, Joan Churchill, people like that. So uh, he kind of knew a lot of the kind of top filmmakers. And, uh, but his main passion was kind of getting uh, his curriculum at Rice in Houston was to have uh, not a film program, but kind of, uh, I mean, as a specialist, but to have students from anthropology, chemistry, so forth come and learn how to use film, Super 8, or uh, later it was video, a uh, half inch video, and to make films about their own projects. And so that was kind of a total exception to <laughs> the so-called professional at NYU or at, and even at filmmaking programs around the country. And he was very committed to, uh, he started programs with me at Buffalo and, and in Houston. Uh, at that time, uh, when they were teaching young people, like meaning kids 9, 10, 11, we often would kind of have them uh, do drawings and and then do animation and uh, to make and make their own sound effects and so forth. And uh, what he did was he had a media bus because uh, he had, was used to kind of filming in Algeria and using kind of a media bus and which had screens and uh, that could be set up outside uh, to show films to the to the Muslim population, which he used had been making shot films for after he graduated from EDHEC. and. Uh, he would then send them into Texas towns, and uh, he would uh, he would uh, have them try to do a history of the town, and then show it to all of the people. And uh, he would start with having them visit the cemetery to see who had lived there. And it occurred to me I, the reason I mention it now is when I came yesterday, I saw this Pioneer Cemetery, which is part of the university, and I wonder if that played any role at all. Well, we'll claim that for sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's an interesting, <laughs> yeah. That uh, so he was very much involved in having in in using uh, film to teach people history, as with the young black woman, or with uh, you know teenager, mm -hmm. or uh, the people in the, these Texas towns. And uh, he was very matter of fact. I mean, he would teach people how to dress to go and ask for an interview. Uh, he would teach them how to ask for an interview. Uh, <laughs> he would then teach them how to use all the equipment and edit so forth. Then teach how to budget and so forth. So. It would be a two-year process where they'd do research and then they'd actually contact all the people that were going to be in the film, then they'd shoot and film and edit it, and it was a, a four-semester course in this complex. Uh, that's the last film we worked on was Unemployment in Buffalo. Mm -hmm. So he was very much interested in kind of social issues and also in making sure that we understood the complexity and that we heard from all sides and so forth. Yeah. How did you come to meet him? It's an interesting story. Uh, I was uh, leaving, I was a medievalist, and I was leaving Buffalo, I mean, sorry, leaving Rice in Houston to teach at the State University of New York at Buffalo. And a millionaire uh, who now has a famous museum, the Menil Collection, 
in Houston, uh, John and, um, and his wife Dominique, asked me if I'd come to the University of St. Thomas and start a, uh, start a film program there. And uh, I, uh, I took a leave from the University of Buffalo to, to do that. And at one point I said to them, they wanted a program, they were kind of interested in art history. I wanted them to kind of include, even though I had no experience in it or knowledge of it, to include making. And uh, I had no idea who would be a, uh, and there were no film, except for UCLA and USC, at that time there were no film courses in the US. I mean, it was just these industrial film programs, mm -hmm. and they had been up there since 1935. They had never had, uh, uh, one of their graduates had never made a Hollywood film. I mean, it was five years later, they had Copler and Lucas and, and Spike Lee and uh, what's his name, um, Marty Scorsese <laughs> and so forth from NYU. <laughs> but that was kind of the revolution. He was, you know, on that, on that cutting edge. So uh, John Demonio knew a man named Jack Valenti, who later became the head of the Motion Picture Association mm -hmm. of America. Mm -hmm. But at that time, he had happened to be, uh, he had been a Houston councilman, uh, was a public relations person, had run for office, and John Demonio had helped support him. Mm -hmm. But he now was Lyndon Johnson's, um, um, uh, what Jay Connie is now, his press secretary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so uh, John knew him personally, and uh, Lyndon Johnson had just started this American Film Institute, and George Stevens, his son, was the head of it. Uh, and he asked, uh, he called Valenti and asked him if he, uh, if I could see George Stevens. So I went to George Stevens, flew to Washington. <laughs> I asked him if I could, uh, if he could suggest, because ah. he was kind of an authority. He was a filmmaker. He had helped work with his father. It, it turned out. Uh, he wasn't the right person to ask, I think. I mean, he was the perfect person because he mentioned James Blue, but he, he didn't really know that much about filmmaking, and filmmaking wasn't in the college curriculum then. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, within, uh, within 10 years, there were 1,500 you know, programs that had some type of film in the colleges in the United States, so it spread like wildfire. So uh, he said, oh, he said, there's this fellow James Blue, he would know, and uh, why don't you ask my secretary and she'll, he's in New York editing a film, uh, was a film called A Few Notes on Our, on our Food Problems, were being made for the agency, it won international prizes. And uh, she, uh, it turned out she was, she was to marry James Blue. And so I met him that evening when he returned from New York and... Uh, the rest is history. Yeah, the rest is kind of history. I mean, to give you some sense, at that time, I mean, we had, uh, you know, no equipment. We were just starting a program. Uh, we were at a very small Catholic school, and uh, the salary that I offered him was $12,000, and that was kind of the best kind of situation he could get for a person of his kind of, you know, he's the only filmmaker I know who's made films on all five continents. He's made films in Algeria and Kenya and Taiwan in India and Brazil. Uh, he was kind of a global filmmaker long before we had the concept. Mm -hmm. And shooting on, you know, with, uh, uh, with um, on 35 millimeter film with crews and all the resources at his command. So they were basically kind of a Hollywood kind of, I mean, uh, of that caliber, not of that uh, uh, framework, but I mean, of they were well-financed films. And they were then well taken care of. So. Again, although kind of unknown to most young filmmakers now, his films are better preserved than kind of anyone's, and all on, you know, in France and, and, in, uh, and in Washington, so except for the last two that he shot in Houston. Yeah. So many of them are in the Library of Congress, is that right? Oh, yeah. 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 So you could go there to see them? Yeah, you can get them and you can actually make a video now, and now you can show them. Uh, they're allowed to be shown. I don't, I, I don't know, you have to get permission and uh, you can't buy them because they're not for sale, I, I mean, or for rent, but uh, you can get access to them now, yeah. You mentioned in passing that you were a scholar of medieval literature. Yes, you, yeah. You had been a Marshall scholar. You studied with C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien. That's what right. What led you to become a founder of film and media programs? Well, it, it's, uh, it's an interesting trajectory. I mean, I never gave up medieval. I, I mean, I taught, for many years I taught both. Uh, but uh, 
what happened was the only way to see films uh, when I was teaching at Rice University, for example, starting kind of in 1961 when I came back from, uh, from being at Oxford, um, was that uh, they have a, 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 a student film society where they would show like a film every two weeks or a film a month and they would ask someone to come and, and give a talk. And I was, had won teaching awards always and so they would ask me if I'd come and lead a discussion because anyone was knowledgeable. I mean, there, was no, there were no film scholars, there was no film literature. When I first started teaching film, I would go to the bookstores trying to find any new books that were coming out, and there weren't any. I mean, I was, I was ahead. I simply sat down one summer and I read through all of... <laughs> Did you have any? I read through, I, through Eisenstein, Bazin, so on and so on. And so, so it was just uh, kind of a pa and I was doing it because I like to teach and and like but th that amazed me that in these 90 minutes that you could have uh, you know such an intensity and so I get interested in, in that sense uh, and then uh, when I uh, began looking into it more and seeing that I couldn't create a film school like UCLA or anything like that that I got very enamored of the what I call the poetic cinema of the shot film by independent filmmakers like Frampton and Sharitz and Stan Brackage and so forth. So I be kind of became their champion, and uh, and uh, I'm trying to think that. So it all happened very quickly. Uh, one of the um, factors was I always dressed just like I do now, and uh, and I, and I was known then as a medievalist and someone who you know. Had, had graduate degrees, someone who had studied at Oxford. And so I was of great advantage to the foundations who wanted to, they kind of used me, I didn't realize it at the time, as someone who was, you know, just an honor, but, you know, an intelligent person. And uh, so I then uh, became <laughs> on the panel of the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Endowment for Humanities and advised the Rockefeller and the Ford and the, uh, and the MacArthur Foundations and the Marco Foundation. So, uh, and I spent enormous, uh, in the first five years, of simply sitting in panels with kind of the best advisors. Uh, one panel had Fred Weissman, Ricky Leacock, uh, all of those, George Stoney, all of those filmmakers discuss why a film was good or bad. So it was like a graduate seminar for me. Well, Gerald, I have <laughs> to interrupt you. Yeah. Thank you for your great service for oh. filmmakers, for yeah, uh, sharing yeah. all your uh, knowledge yeah, about James sure. Blue. We've been speaking with Gerald O'Grady, an early advocate of media studies in academia. O'Grady introduced James Blue's documentary, The March, as UO's Cinema Pacific and the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art kicked off a six-month tribute to James Blue on November 13, 2013. Thanks very much for watching. Mm -hmm.